Silvio, welcome to the show. Oh, th- thank you. Uh, uh, so f- for people who don't know, you're the chief AI scientist at Salesforce. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, chief, uh, chief scientist is, uh, is a role that um, we started when AI Research was founded around, the, around 10 years ago. Um, and uh, the goal is, is for me to supervise and um, uh, look at uh, the different, the, how AI is evolving in, uh, in a company, how can I make AI to create some uh, uh, transformations, innovations uh, for the type of business, the type of products that Salesforce is producing. Uh, so we really focus on um, core innovation, core research that can be eventually deployed in uh, in some of the key products that Salesforce is producing. Hmm. And what, what would be an example of that? So are you guys um, doing research at the foundation model layer? Are you doing fine tuning? Like what like what kinds of things are you doing to uh, on the research front? Yeah, some of the research uh, uh, concept ideas that we developed were really at the um, foundation of uh, some of the key products. And uh, one of the early examples was uh, the um, large language models we build for uh, developers. Uh, so it was a uh, uh, language to code. And it was before ChatGPT was introduced. So it was uh, early, almost like um, four years ago, we started building these kind of models uh, completely in-house. And it was used for uh, um, enhancing our developer uh, efficiency and uh, the opportunity for building code at a, at a faster scale uh, with a larger efficiency. Um, uh, and eventually, this became a GA product uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, then another example is the models we build for the trust layer. So uh, uh, Agent Force um, as a component, which is, which allows to verify that the, the output of those uh, of AI is safe to use for customers. And uh, uh, some of the components uh, that are the foundation for the trust layer were built in house uh, from uh, from our organization. Um, a third example is the uh, Atlas reasoning engine, which was the uh, introduced last year. So when Agent Force was uh, uh, announced to the public, uh, it was uh, equipped with the reasoning engine, which uh, which was uh, incubated within my organization. And it was done in collaboration with the customers uh, through a number of uh, partnerships we had uh, over the years. Got it. And so for people who are listening who maybe haven't interacted that much with the Salesforce e- ecosystem, Agent Force is essentially like your, your chatbot builder, no code or low code application builder for your enterprise customer? Yeah, I would say uh, Agent Force is more like a platform uh, for agentic systems. So it's, uh, it's where uh, our customers can use, uh, deploy agents for their business. Uh, and it's, uh, it's almost like thinking about portfolio of agents, each specialized in different tasks. And those can be used for scaling up for, and for uh, making their own business more efficient, more effective, more productive. Got it. How do you position that against, like, I don't know, if someone's thinking about, I want to make a custom GPT. Should I make a custom GPT or should I build something in, in, in agent force? Like, uh, when should people use open AI directly or anthropic directly versus going with a Salesforce model? Yeah, I would say that, uh, let me actually, uh, back up a little bit with this question. Uh, great question. Uh, in a way, we have to think that agents is not just an LLM. Uh, agents is much more, it's a complex system, which has many, com- uh, various components. Uh, as a memory, so which allows you to retrieve information and data, uh, documents, uh, fuse conversations. And typically the techniques are you, uh, that are relevant are RAG, the retrieval augmented generations or other type of appendix that are used for, for enabling, empowering those memory. The other component is uh, the brain. So it's a reasoning engine that allows you to, um, turn a certain query, a certain task in a series of steps. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's uh, the the the, um, the innovation that I mentioned earlier. So the ability to to reason about uh, a certain um, a certain task that has to be performed by agents. A third component is is the um, actuators. So how to turn those tasks into actions. So uh, essentially, are API calls, function calls that can be uh, invoked by the agents. So it's similar, it's a bit like a toolkit of functions. So let's say send email or, you know, open this w- w- website or, you know, make the reservation. So these are actions. And then finally, the interface, how do agents communicate with the external world through voice, through text, through different modalities. So these four components creates uh, an agent. And, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, as I mentioned, it's not, it's not just an LM. So in a way, you need to really provide the, the right uh, context, the right uh, and uh, you know, connect together these different components to build uh, a full solution can be helpful for enterprise. 
So uh, back to your question. So you cannot just use LM for those applications. You have to build all the infrastructure around and provide the right context for for making those uh, uh, agents function uh, functionable. Got it. And and so uh, thinking about that, like if I have the option, for example, to uh, you know, ChatGPT has like an has an agent builder, or uh, so if I have the option to use both, uh, and presumably I can like pull in Salesforce ecosystem stuff into ChatGPT. How would I make the decision to like use a, a Salesforce specific agent builder versus the other ones? Yeah, so I think uh, agent builder is fundamentally useful if you want to um, connect the dots between uh, the data that customers have and the type of functionalities that can be uh, implemented by the by the agents. Uh, you know, an agent uh, without data without the context is kind of useless. So then if you just have an agent is not plugged into to the, right, the rest of the infrastructure, it's going to be very difficult to implement. That's why uh, at the end of the, 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 the agent builder, the agent builder, an agent force allows you to give all the ingredients for make those agents uh, successful in the in the, this kind of context. It's been really interesting to be here. We're recording at Dreamforce, which is Salesforce's biggest conference. And it's been really interesting to be here because I spend most of my time at, uh, you know, OpenAI or Anthropic or uh, or with small startups. And um, watching the keynote today, for example, there was like the, you know, people, high up executives at Williams and Sonoma and Pepsi. And uh, you're starting, I'm seeing the way that AI is talked about and being deployed at big brands that people have heard of, which is just a bit different from the, you know, startup or foundation model company type stuff that I hear about. What are the what are the unique challenges that Salesforce has to contend with to help these kinds of companies do AI deployments? Like what is actually happening inside of these big companies as they try to deploy AI? Yeah, so I think first of all, uh, it's kind of connect to what we were saying earlier. So connect them to the right uh, uh, data and uh, be able to provide the right um, harmonizations across data to ensure that different touch points are connected because often the customers have siloed data or siloed um, uh, functions. What's a specific example of that? Uh, so for instance, you know, you would have a division that sales, the sales division that has a way, a certain way of managing data. Then you have the marketing di- division, which are a different way. So connecting dots is very important. Uh, if you don't connect the dots, if you don't have uh, the right level of harmonizations across data, uh, AI cannot operate well. That's one aspect. Second aspect, which has, is very important, is about trust. So uh, 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 customers are very concerned about the, the, the quality, the accuracy of uh, AI. So the kind of if AI is safe to use from the, from the trust perspective. And uh, in a way, um, we have seen that many of those LLM are sometimes are producing what you call jagged intelligence. So they produce performances which goes to very you know, amazing peaks. They can prove theorems, they can become a gold medalist, but then they can also fail in some uh, <laughs> yeah. tasks which are really related to common sense. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, in many situations, actually these common sense tasks are relevant for business. Imagine that you're asking um, an agent to get a loan and you get an answer from a loan agent and the loan agency is coming up with wrong computations or something that you know doesn't make sense. It's going to be a big, big bummer, you know, for the customer and also for the bank or for the financial institution. So ensuring consistency and uh, at the same time also push the boundaries of what those agents can do is very, very important. And that's where you know we uh, assist for really trying to uh, ensure that the, the, the quality is matched with the capabilities. I know in order to do that, you're building simulation environments. Can you tell me about why that is and what kinds of simulation environments you're, you're making? Yeah, so simulation environments uh, for us is a key for uh, enabling this kind of trust and this kind of quality that I just mentioned earlier. Um, unfortunately, you know, we are getting a situation in the scaling low on learning. So uh, those, uh, even GPT-5, is not, we have not seen a really breakthrough that... Uh, you know, some people uh, it was imagining in the beginning, um, and we still see this kind of jaggedness, this kind of inconsistency in some of the results. So uh, we have to move into new paradigm of learning based on experience, based on uh, you know, see how these agents uh, behave in the real world, and the best way to do that is plugging them into simulation environments. In simulation environments essentially allows us to stress test the agents and understand when they fail. Based on the, uh, on this kind of awareness, we can provide feedback to uh, improve the agent performances. And these are enterprise uh, environment. It's not like a uh, game environment. It's not like a, a Formula One or other racing environment. These are, are actually simulation of CRM or enterprise environments with their own fields, their own objects. Um, and we simulate, for instance, for Agent Force, we have been start simulating a voice, voice agents uh, by 
um, uh, testing them with a number of uh, different type of voices, you know, voices with noise, background noise, uh, with different accent, like sometimes with my Italian accent, uh, how, how the agent will react to this kind of uh, situations or maybe conflicting uh, request or incomplete request. These are all uh, corner cases and uh, that, that makes agents tend to fail and that's why we want to make them super robust. How do you make an environment for that though? Like what does that actually look like? It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's an environment where you have to simulate, um, uh, organizations, B2B, B2C, and we start feeding them with the data, with sy- synthetic data. And synthetic data has to be also mimic real world data or can be validated by experts. And the challenge here is to, uh, to do, uh, to fill the so-called reality gap, the gap between the simulations and the reality. That's actually, uh, w- part of the work in progress. Got it. And so, like, is is the is the simulation environment that you're talking about? Is it like uh, uh, a computer that the that the LM can use with uh, a bunch of simulated data about what what kind of company it's working inside of? Or like, give yeah, me yeah, a little it, bit more. So, yeah. So these are essentially uh, simulation organization. Let's say you know in um, you are simulating uh, a service um, uh, a customer service where you're uh, simulating the way how the agents will uh, talk to uh, a human. In this case, you simulate the human as well. Uh, and then uh, the, the environment will have different um, uh, components, which, uh, which allows you to pull out data uh, for answering this kind of customer service questions. They say about return, about you know, uh, product availability, about policies. It is all simulated or you know, built based on the uh, real information that customers are giving us. And this allows us to kind of be more, almost like um, gameplay where uh, the agents plays with another, uh, you know, fake human. <laughs> and then they, 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 and we measure potential area of, of failure. Oh, interesting. Uh, so we're almost out of time. We have time for one more question. Um, one thing I'm curious about is you've been in the field for a long time. Um, obviously, the rate of progress has been pretty high for the last like couple years where do you think we'll be in the next in the next couple years uh in ai in general and um in ai as it's being used by businesses yeah i think the main innovation will come when we're gonna see agents deployed the scale uh soon we're gonna have um we're gonna be having our own personal agents and personal agents will be will perform a task on our behalf uh so if i want to let's say to back to the example of the loan i want to get a loan I won't call the bank myself. I can ask my agents to call the bank. Uh, and then there's going to be interaction between my agents, my agents and agents' banks. So we're going to be, we have to imagine a future where the agents to talk to each other. We need to redefine new protocol of communications. Uh, what are the guardrails? You know, and uh, it's going to be almost like thinking about uh, the internet before the internet, right? Uh, so but, but the world society will completely transform and it will be very exciting. Awesome. Sounds exciting. Silvio, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. absolutely positively have to smash that like button and subscribe to ai and i why because this show is the epitome of awesomeness it's like finding a treasure chest in your backyard but instead of gold it's filled with pure unadulterated knowledge bombs about chat gpt every episode is a roller coaster of emotions insights and laughter that will leave you on the edge of your seat craving for more It's not just a show, it's a journey into the future with Dan Shipper as the captain of the spaceship. So do yourself a favor, hit like, smash subscribe, and strap in for the ride of your life. And now, without any further ado, let me just say, Dan, I'm absolutely, hopelessly in love with you.